proclaiming the message of salvation. Though we are among those who have not seen Jesus Christ, we are to proclaim the message of salvation based on the accounts of reliable eyewitnesses. Here's Gene. As we look into this little letter, it becomes very clear that John believed that he was an authentic eyewitness of Jesus Christ. And of course, we believe he was. And so he's writing, and uh, right from the very beginning of this letter, he makes a very significant uh, declaration about Jesus Christ. And here's what he wrote, what was from the beginning, what we have heard. Now let me just simply say I've highlighted the pronouns, and you'll see them all the way through. Because when he says we or us, he's probably referring to the other apostles, those that Jesus has chosen to be his special representatives, the apostles of Jesus Christ. So he says what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. That life was revealed and we have seen it, and we testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us." What a powerful opening to this letter. In many respects, it's an extension of his gospel, which, by the way, uh, we believe he wrote a short time before he wrote these, uh, sh these short letters. And let me simply say that he's probably in his early 90s when he wrote uh, these letters, when he wrote the gospel, and then later he wrote uh, these little letters. So he's reflecting back towards the end of the first century. And uh, many of the eyewitnesses of Christ have already passed on and no longer were on this earth. But you'll see the extension, I think, of the gospel because he says uh, that which was from the beginning. And you remember how he began the Gospel of John? He simply said, in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. This is John chapter 1 in the Gospel. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelled among us. In other words, what he's saying is we saw Him, we touched Him, uh, we beheld Him. We observed His glory not just an ordinary person that came into this world, but we observed His glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth." In other words, he's reinforcing here in 1 John, we saw Him, we heard Him, we touched Him, we came to the conclusion that He was indeed eternal life Himself. Now, when you stop and think about uh, these opening words, this opening introduction, basically what he is saying, and we could spend all evening illustrating what he's saying, but let's just take a look at uh, a few of the illustrations of what this really means. For nearly three years, they, that is the apostles, heard him teach as they traveled together in Judea, Samaria, and particularly in Galilee. Now think of that and think about what that really means. Here you can see the travels of Jesus all the way from Jerusalem all the way to the Sea of Galilee and even further north, way up on, on the border. And for three and a half years they traveled with Him, most of the time around the Sea of Galilee. Probably about 18 months of the three years was around the Sea of Galilee and they traveled with Him and they watched Him, and they saw Him, and they heard Him. For nearly three years, they saw Him with their own eyes. They watched with amazement as He healed the sick. And there are so many references to the healings. And the apostles saw this firsthand. They saw Him multiply the bread and the fish, and they fed thousands on two occasions. One time, 5,000 besides women and children, uh, another occasion, 4,000 besides women and children. They saw Him walk on the water. They saw Him still the storm. Several times this happened. 
And um, they even saw him raise the dead. And so John is saying, we are reliable witnesses. We saw all of these things. Furthermore, for nearly three years, they had opportunity to extend a hand as Jesus stepped into a boat. And that just illustrates humanness, doesn't it? He's getting into a boat, and they just reach out, and they help him into this boat, their master, the one that they were following. Put their hands on his shoulders, perhaps, as he made his way through the crowds. Because the crowds sometimes just surrounded him, and so they perhaps were just guiding him. They may have shook his arm to waken him while he was asleep in the boat. So John is saying, we saw all these things. We, we heard all of these things. And we certainly touched him. Now, it's interesting that John particularly had a very close relationship and friendship with Jesus. Uh, in his humanness, Jesus uh, had a close friendship with John. John had a close friendship with Jesus, even though John was a pretty rebellious guy in his day and uh, had to learn a lot about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. But even before that happened, he was a friend of Jesus in a special way. On one occasion, we read, and John records this, but he's talking really about himself. One of his disciples, the one Jesus loved, was reclining close beside Jesus. And that's saying it very softly, because literally he was leaning against Jesus. And Simon Peter motioned to him to find out who it was he was talking about. And he, Jesus had said that one of you is going to betray me. And that really shook them up. So Peter says to John, who's close to Jesus, who's he talking about? Ask him. So John leaned back against Jesus and asked him, Lord, who is it? You see, when John said, we touched him, he really understood that in terms of his special friendship with Jesus Christ. And then on another occasion, this is really fascinating, um, and Luke records this right at the end of his gospel on the life of Jesus. And he tells the story of the Emmaus disciples. These men, two of them, were disciples of Jesus, and they were on the way to Emmaus. It's a little town shortly, uh, a short distance relatively from Jerusalem. And, of course, the word was out that Jesus had been raised from the dead, and they were having an argument. And we don't know what they were saying, except some, one of them may have said, it's impossible, and the other said, but we've heard it. And while they're arguing about it, Jesus just appears and walks with them and begins to ask them about the Messiah. And they don't know they're talking to Jesus, the resurrected Christ. And as they come to the place where they stayed, these two men, they invited Jesus to stay, and so Jesus did. And, and then an amazing thing happened. Before they ate, Jesus broke bread, and their eyes were open, and they realized it was the resurrected Christ. Now, what did they do? They immediately went and reported to the apostles. And that's what we read about here in Luke 24, 36 to 39. As they, that is, these Emmaus disciples, were saying these things, telling the story, he himself, Jesus, stood in their midst. He just suddenly appeared, and he said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. And you can imagine what that was like. And Jesus said, why are you troubled? He asked them, And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Then notice these words that relate so much to what John wrote right at the introduction. Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you can see I have. So, isn't it interesting that that story right there and what Jesus told them, John is almost repeating when he writes this little epistle regarding his hands. They touched him, their hands. They saw the nail prints. They walked with him. They talked with him. And so he's saying, without equivocation, 
Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God. In fact, He is God, which He emphasizes throughout this little epistle and which He emphasized in His gospel. Now, here's a very um, significant question, and it's a question for all of us because none of us have seen Jesus 2,000 years later, but when John wrote this epistle, it was towards the end of the first century, and he's representing having seen Jesus. This is nearly 60 years, you see, after Jesus was crucified and resurrected. And so the question is, how can we help those who hesitate to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God because they have never encountered Him face to face? And that includes us. Well, one of the things is to look at the historical records. And let me just share with you quickly and briefly. Notice this quotation from Edward Glenny. God has given us 5,656 manuscripts containing all or parts of the Greek New Testament. It is the most remarkable preserved book in the ancient world. Not only do we have a great number of manuscripts, but they're very close in time to the originals they represent. That's a very significant statement, and we'll demonstrate why that is so significant in just a moment. These facts are all the more amazing when they're compared with the preservation of other ancient literature. For example, let me give you a couple quick illustrations. Herodotus, the book he wrote on history. It was written in 480 to 425 B.C. The earliest copies we have are into the first century in A.D. 900. The time gap is 1,350 years, and there are only eight copies of what was the original. And yet nobody questions that history. Think about that. Plato. The Republic, 1,300 years, the copies that we have of what was the original. There are only seven copies available, and yet people believe this is the writings of Plato. Another illustration, Caesar, the Gallic Wars. There's a thousand-year time gap and only ten copies, and yet this becomes an authentic piece of literature that people believe. Pliny Secundus, his natural history, 750 years from the originals, and there are only seven copies. Now think about that. Compare that with the New Testament. There were multiple authors. The date written between 50 and 100 A.D., earliest copies. In A.D. 114, there were fragments, 50 years from the time it happened and was recorded originally. A.D. 200, there were books, whole books, 100 years later. A.D. 250, most of the New Testament, which is 150 years later. A.D. 325, the complete New Testament, only a difference of 225 years. But notice the number of copies involved in these fragments, these books of the New Testament, 5,656 copies. Compare that with ancient history and what people believe. Think about that in terms of the authentication of the New Testament and what it teaches about Jesus Christ. So here's the principle that comes from this opening introduction to this little epistle. Though we are among those who have not seen Jesus Christ, we're to proclaim the message of salvation based on the accounts of reliable eyewitnesses.